Personal History of David Copperfield by Charles Dickens Part one, I fall into disgrace. Of days that have as happy been, and you remember me. Mrs. David Copperfield? Yes? Miss Trotwood, your late husband's aunt. You have heard of her, I dare say? I... I have had that pleasure. Now you see her. Yes. Please, uh, come in. Will you come in here, Miss Trotwood? There is a fire. Thank you. (laughs) Don't do that. Come, come. Take off your cap and let me see you. Why, bless my heart, you're a baby. I'm afraid I was but a childish widow, and I'll be but a childish mother, if I live. Why rookery in the name of heaven? Do you mean the house, ma'am? Mm. The name was Mr. Copperfield's choice. When he bought the house, he liked to think that there were rooks about it. And where are the birds? Well, there haven't been any since we lived here. We thought it was a rookery, but the nests were very old ones. David Copperfield all over. Takes the birds on trust because he sees the nests. Mr Copperfield is dead. If you dare to speak unkindly of him... (laughs) Come, child. Sit down. You've gone pale. There. When do you expect? I can't stop trembling. I don't know what's the matter. I shall die. (laughs) No, you won't. Have some tea. What, What do you call your girl? I don't know if it will be a girl. Bless the baby, I don't mean that. I mean your servant girl. Peggotty. Do you mean to say that any human being has gone into a Christian church and got herself named Peggotty? It's her surname. Mr Copperfield called her by it because her Christian name is the same as mine. Here. Peggotty! Tea! Your mistress is unwell. Don't dawdle. (laughs) You were speaking about it being a girl. I have no doubt it will be a girl. Now, child, from the birth of this girl... Oh, perhaps, boy. I have a presentiment that it must be a girl. Oh, Don't really? contradict. From the moment of this girl's birth, I intend to be her friend. I will be her godmother, and I want you to call her Betsy Trotwood Copperfield. There must be no mistakes in life with this Betsy Trotwood. There must be no trifling with her affections, poor dear. She must be well guarded from reposing any foolish confidences where they are not deserved. I shall make that my care. Was David good to you, child? We were very happy. Mr Copperfield was too good to me. (laughs) He spoilt you, I suppose. For being quite alone in this rough world. Yes, he did. (sighs) Poor baby. Do you know anything? I beg your pardon, ma'am. About keeping house, for instance. Not much, I fear. But Mr Copperfield was teaching me. Much he knew about it himself. I hope I should have improved. But the great misfortune of his death. (gasps) 
I kept my housekeeping book regularly and balanced it with Mr. Copperfield every night. Uh, well, well, don't cry any more. I'm sure we never had a word of difference about it, except when Mr. Copperfield objected to my threes and fives being too much like each other and to my putting curly tails to my sevens and nines. You'll make yourself <laughs> ill, and that won't be good for you or for my goddaughter. Ow! Oh. What's this? Good heavens, you shall be upstairs in bed. Peggotty, see to your mistress. She needs you. Yes, ma'am. There, Mrs. Cottonfield, there. Come here with me. I think that's time to fetch Dr. Chillip. And so, to begin my life with the beginning of my life, I was born as I've been informed and believe, on a Friday at 12 o'clock at night. It was remarked that the clock began to strike and I began to cry simultaneously. Well, Mom, I am happy to congratulate you. How is she? Well, ma'am, she will soon be quite comfortable, I hope. <laughs> quite as comfortable as we can expect a young mother to be under the melancholy domestic circumstances. And she? How is she? Uh, ma'am? The baby! How is she? <laughs> ma'am, <laughs> I apprehended you had known. It's a boy. Oh! Ma'am? My aunt walked out and never came back. She had vanished like a discontented fairy. The first objects I recall when I look back to my childhood are my mother with her pretty hair and youthful shape, and Peggotty with no shape at all, and cheeks and arms so hard and red that I wondered that birds didn't peck at her in preference to apples. What else do I remember? Let me see. I remember the quiet churchyard I could see from my bedroom window, the churchyard where my father's white gravestone lay. I felt sorry for it, lying all alone in the dark night, while our little parlour was warm and bright with fire and candle. I remember reading stories to Peggotty by that parlour fire. She would sit there sewing, sometimes touching me with a forefinger so rough it felt like a nutmeg grater. I thought her beautiful. The mother crocodile comes out of the water to lay her eggs in the sand so that the warmth of the sun may hatch them. I remember one particular night very well. When her baby's aboard, I'd been reading to her from a book about crocodiles. My mother was spending the evening at a neighbour's and we were all alone. Peggotty, are you listening? Yes, Master Davy. Oh, drop that there cotton, that don't match. Go on, do. Master Davy, what is it? Peggotty. Yes, my dear? I was wondering, were you ever married? Lord, Master Davy, what make you ask that? But were you ever married? You're a very handsome woman, aren't you? <laughs> Me handsome, Davy? Lord, no, my dear. <laughs> but what's put marriage into your head? You mustn't marry more than one person at a time, must you, Peggotty? Certainly not. But if you marry a person and the person dies, why then you may marry another person, mayn't you, Peggotty? You may if you choose, my dear. That's a matter of opinion. But what is your opinion, Peggotty? My opinion is that I was never married myself and that I don't expect to be. That's all I know about the subject. You ain't cross, Peggotty, are you? Cross? Why, bless the child, no. No, do you let me hear some more about the crocodiles? For I ain't heard half enough. Oh, that be your mother come home. Mama? Davy? Davy, darling? Oh. oh, you're more highly privileged than a monarch, my little man. What does that mean? Why, Davy? That's rude to Mr. Murdstone when he's been kind enough to bring me home. No, no, he's protecting you. I don't wonder at his devotion. Come, David, 
Let's say good night and be the best friends in the world. Shake hands, my boy. Davy, that's the wrong hand. <laughs> Let go of mine. No! Never mind, he's a brave little fellow. Good night, Mum. Good night. I hope you had a pleasant evening, Mum. Much obliged to you, Peggotty. I had a very pleasant evening. Come, Davy. <laughs> yes, Mama. Why, my darling, you're half asleep. Come into the parlour by the fire. A strange or so makes an agreeable change. A very agreeable change indeed, Peggotty. Not such a one as this, Mr. Copperfield, wouldn't have liked. That I say and that I swear. Oh, good heavens, you'll drive me mad. Was any poor girl so ill-used by her servants as I am? Oh, have I never been married, Peggotty? God, no, you have, ma'am. Then how can you dare... You know I don't mean how can you dare, Peggotty. But how can you have the heart to say such bitter things to me when you know that I haven't a single friend to turn to? The more's the reason for saying that won't do. How can you go on as if all were settled and arranged when I tell you over and over again that beyond the commonest civilities, nothing has passed? That may be. What am I to do? Do you want me to shave my head and black my face? I dare say you do, Peggotty. I dare say you'd quite enjoy it. No, ma'am. And my own dear boy, my own little Davy, is it to be hinted to me that I'm wanting in my affection for my precious treasure? Nobody never went and hinted no such thing. You did, Peggotty. You know you did. Am I a naughty mamma to you, Davy? No, mamma. Am I a nasty, cruel, selfish, bad mamma? No, indeed. <sighs> Say yes, my child, and Peggotty will love you. And Peggotty's love is a great deal better than mine, oh. Davy. I don't love you at all, oh. do I? <laughs> yes, mamma. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and so we all went to bed greatly dejected. In the next weeks, I became used to seeing Mr. Murdstone about our house. He had beautiful black hair and whiskers, but I didn't like him. Peggotty was less with us of an evening than she had always been, and we were less comfortable among ourselves. One day, Mr. Murdstone decided to take me with him to Lowestoft, where he was meeting a friend who was there with a yacht. We went to an hotel by the sea, where a gentleman was waiting for us on the terrace. He was sitting at a little table, smoking a cigar and drinking sherry. Hello, Murdstone. I thought you were dead. Not yet, indeed. And who's this shaver? That's Davy. Davy who? Jones? Copperfield. What? Bewitching Mrs. Copperfield's encumbrance? Pretty little widow? Quinion. Hmm? Take care, if you please. Somebody's sharp. Who is? Only Brooks of Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> and what is the opinion of... Brooks of Sheffield about the projected business. Well, I don't know that Brooks understands much about it at present, but he is not generally favourable, I believe. Never mind. We'll drink to him. Murston. Thank you. This young gentleman will take a little sherry too, my boy. Thank you, sir. Now I want you to give the toast. Yes, sir. Say after me, confusion to Brooks of Sheffield. Confusion to Brooks of Sheffield. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> Brooks of, of Sheffield. Sheffield. <laughs> what was it they said, Davy? Tell me again. I can't believe it. Bewitching. <gasps> it was never bewitching. Yes, it was. Bewitching Mrs. Copperfield. <gasps> and pretty. No. No, it was never pretty. Yes, it was. <gasps> Not pretty. Pretty little widow. <gasps> What foolish, impudent creatures. Oh, Davy, dear, don't tell Peggotty. She might be angry with them. I am dreadfully angry with them myself, but I would rather Peggotty didn't know. Promise you won't tell her. I promise. Master Davy? Yes, Peggotty? How should you like to go along with me and spend a fortnight at my brother's at Yarmouth? Wouldn't that be a treat? Is your brother an agreeable man, Peggotty? Oh, what an agreeable man he is. Then there's the sea, and the boats, and ships, and the fishermen, and the beach, and my nephew Ham to play with. But what will Mother say? Well, I'll ask her as soon as she comes home. 
and I'll as good as bet the guinea that she'll let us go. But what's she to do while we're gone? She can't live by herself. Oh, bless you. Don't you know? She said she's going to stay for a fortnight with Mrs Graper. It touches me nearly now to recollect how eager I was to leave my happy home. How little I suspected what I was to leave forever. Mr Marcus, stop! Stop! Whoa! David, dearest, one more kiss for your mamma. Goodbye, my precious. Oh, mamma. Clara? Clara? I'm coming. Goodbye, my darling. Goodbye, mamma. Goodbye. Here. The carrier's cart moved away, taking Peggotty and me with it. We left my mother standing in the road. Mr. Murdstone was with her and he seemed to reproach her for being so moved. I wondered what business it was of his. When we first saw Yarmouth, I felt disappointed. It looked rather spongy and soppy, and so flat, I couldn't help wondering if the world was really as round as my geography book said, how any part of it came to be so flat. But as we came into the town, I saw the streets were full of sailors and carts jingling over the stones, and they smelled of fish and pitch and tar. I liked it much better then. Ham, over here. Right, you heads, Clara. Ham's come to meet us, Master Davy. Ham's your nephew. That's right. Oh, ho, ho. you've grown a bit since the last saw you, sir. Come, you on, sir. Up my shoulders with you. There you go, Davy. Up you go. Ham had a boy's face, but he was a huge, strong well, fellow, well, six well, foot well. high, and he swung me onto his shoulders with no trouble at all. We went through the town till we came out upon a wilderness of sea and sand and sky with nothing to break the horizon but an old black barge high and dry on the ground with a smoking iron funnel sticking out of it. Yon's our else, Master Davy. Where? That ship looking thing? That's it. If it had been Aladdin's palace, I couldn't have been more delighted. Certainly, I might have thought it small and inconvenient if it had been a house. Its charm lay in its being a real boat, which had never been intended to be lived in on dry land. Evening, Clara. How we are? Evening, young sir. Good evening. We were welcomed by a very civil woman in a white apron and a large hairy man with a good-natured face who gave Peggotty a smacking kiss. From the general propriety of her conduct, I concluded he must be her brother. And so he was. That's good. And this is Master Davy, oh. my brother Dan or Davy. Glad to see you, sir. You find us rough, but you find us ready. Thank you, Mr. Peggotty. Mm. I'm sure I'll be very happy here. And how's your ma, sir? Did you leave her pretty jolly? Yes, very jolly. Mm. She, she sent you her compliments. Oh, I'm much obliged to her, I'm sure. Well, sir, I hope you can make out with us for a fortnight, along with Clara and Ham and, and little Emily here. Come you here, my little love. Mm -hmm. and say hello to Master Davy. No. Huh? Oh. No. Oh. oh, I'm sorry, sir. She, she don't mean no disrespect. She's a shy one, is our Emily. I think I was disappointed. For little Emily was the most beautiful little girl I'd ever seen. But I forgot that when I saw my bedroom. In the stern of the vessel, with a little window where the rudder used to go through, and a patchwork counterpane that made my eyes ache with its brightness. It's like a ship's cabin. <laughs> oh, Peggotty, it's lovely. I thought as how you'd like it. It was altogether a delightful house. Not less delightful to me, because everything smelt of fish. We dined sumptuously off boiled dabs, melted butter, and potatoes with a chop for me. Afterwards, when Mr. Peggotty was smoking his pipe, I felt it was time for conversation and confidence. <sighs> Mr. Peggotty? Mm, yes, sir. Did you give your son the name of Ham because you lived in a sort of ark? No, sir. I never gave him no name. Who gave him that name, then? Why, sir? His father, give it him. I thought you were his father. Oh. My brother Joe were his father. Dead, Mr. Peggotty. Drowned dead. 
But little Emily, mm. she's your daughter, isn't she? No, sir. My brother-in-law, Tom, were her father. Dead, Mr. Peggotty. <sighs> Drowned dead. Haven't you any children, Mr. Peggotty? No, master. I'm a, a bachelor. A bachelor? Mm -hmm. Then who's that lady? <laughs> Ask Mrs. Gummidge. Master Davy, that's getting late. You must be tired. Come you on, no bedtime. <laughs> there now. Let's get you tucked in tight. There. All right. You see, Ham and Emily were both left orphans, Master Davy. Two little children with no one as could care for them. My brother adopted them at different times. And Mrs. Gummidge? Did your brother adopt her too? Well, in a way. She's the widow of his partner. He died very poor, did Mr Gummidge. My brother's a poor man himself, mind, but he's good as gold and true as steel. And kind. Locks, Mas Davy. I only ever seen him lose his temper when someone thank him or tell him how good he is. Then he'll swear he'll be gormed if he won't cut and run for good if anyone ever mentions it again. What's gormed? Well, I don't rightly know, Mas Davy. But that's a very strong manner of speech. Very strong. The following day was bright and sunny. I went out with little Emily, who'd got over her shyness, and we walked along the beach, picking up stones and looking at the sea and the sailing boats. I'm afraid of the sea. I've seen it very cruel to some of our men. I've seen it tear a boat as big as a house, all to pieces. I hope it wasn't the boat that your father... That, that father was drowned in. And... No, not that one. I never see that there boat. Nor him? No, not to remember. I never saw my father. My mother and I have always lived by ourselves. Oh. We're very happy. We'll always live just by ourselves. My father's buried in the churchyard. My father ain't got a grave. He were lost at sea. And my mother's dead too. Besides, your father was a gentleman. And your mother's a lady. And my father was a fisherman. And my mother was a fisherman's daughter. And my uncle Dan is a fisherman. Dan is Mr Peggotty, is he? Yes. He must be very good. <laughs> oh, if I was ever to be a lady, I'd... Give him a sky blue coat with diamond buttons, nankin trousers, a red velvet waistcoat, a cocked hat, a large gold watch, a silver pipe, and a box of money. Would you like to be a lady? <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, I'd like it very much. We'd all be gentlefolk together then. Me, an uncle, Ham, and Mrs. Gummidge. We wouldn't mind the storms then, not for ourselves. But we would for the poor fishermen. We'd help them with money if they came to any harm. Do you think you are afraid of the sea now? No. You don't seem to be afraid of it. You walk so close to it. <laughs> I'm not afraid of it in this way. But I wake when it blow and tremble to think of Uncle Dan and Ham. I believe I hear him crying for help. I'm not a bit afraid in this way. <laughs> Look! She ran down the jetty and out along a jagged timber that protruded from it and overhung the deep water at some height without the least defence. Emily, come back! <laughs> Emily, Emily! She soon turned and came back safe to me and I laughed at my fears. Are you frighten me? <laughs> there have been times since, in my manhood, when I have pictured again little Emily as I saw her that day, standing on the edge of her destruction, looking far out to sea. We strolled a long way, put some stranded starfish back into the water. I don't know whether they'd have thanked us for it or not, and then made our way home. Davy? Yes? Would you like to kiss me? Yes, please. 
Of course, I was in love with little Emily. I'm sure I loved that baby quite as tenderly as in the best loves of a later time of life. I made a very angel of that blue-eyed mite, and if she'd spread a little pair of wings and flown away before my eyes, I don't think I'd have been surprised. In the boat, I soon found out that poor Mrs. Gummidge did not always make herself as agreeable as she might have done. Oh, it's cold. Very cold. It certainly is cold. Everybody must feel it so. Oh, I feel it more than other people. That's late. That was late. Not so very late. Well, he's gone to the willing mind. I know he has. I knew this morning he'd go there. Ah, well, mates, and how are you all? Hey, Donald. Uh, oh, cheer up, old more than what's amiss. Nothing, Donald. <sighs> you come from the Willing Mind. Oh, yes, I've took a short spell at the Willing Mind tonight. I'm sorry I should drive you there. Drive? I don't need no driving. I go only too ready. Oh, very ready, yeah, very ready. I'm sorry that you should be so ready long of me. Long of you? Didn't long of you? Don't you believe a bit on it? Oh, yes, yes it is. Oh. I know what I am. I know that I'm a lone, lorn creature, and not only that everything goes contrary with me, but that... I go contrary with everybody. No. Yes! Wow. yes. Well, I feel more than other people do, and I show it more. That's my misfortune. I go contrary. No such thing. Now cheer up, old gal. I am what I could wish myself to be. I'm far from it. I know what I am. My troubles has made me contrary. I wish I didn't feel them, but I do. I wish I could be hardened to them, but I can't. Oh, I make the house uncomfortable. I don't wonder at it. I've made your sister so all day, and Master oh. Davy. No, you haven't, Mrs Gummidge. Oh, that's far from right that I should do it. And a fair return. I... Better go into the house and die. Oh. I'm a lone, lone creature, and much better not make myself contrary here. If things must go contrary with me, and I must go contrary myself, let me go contrary in me parish. That I be better go into the poor house and, and die and, and be a riddance. <laughs> She's been thinking of the old one. The old one? Mr. Gummidge. Whenever Mrs. Gummidge was overcome in a similar manner during the remainder of our stay, which happened several times, Mr. Peggotty said the same thing to excuse her, and always with the tenderest commiseration. So the fortnight slipped away, and at last the day came for going home. I was greatly overcome at parting from little Emily, but as the carrier's cart drew nearer home, I got very excited and couldn't wait to get there and run into my mother's arms. Whoa! We're home! Oh, Peggotty, we're home! Mama! Where's my mother? Peggotty, isn't she come home? Yes. Yes, Master Davy, she's come home. Why hasn't she come to the door? Oh, Peggotty, she's not dead. No. Peggotty, what's happened? You see, dear, I should have told you afore, but I couldn't exactly bring my mind to it. Mas Davy, what do you think? You have got a pa, a new one. A new one? Yes, do come and see him. I don't want to see him. And your mama, come. They're there, in the parlour. Go you in, Davy. Davy, Davy, dear. Mark Taylor, my love, recollect, control yourself. <laughs> Uh, David, my boy, how do you do? After a moment, I went and kissed my mother. Davy. She kissed me gently and sat down to her embroidery. I could not look at her. 
I could not look at him. As soon as I could creep away, I crept upstairs. My old dear bedroom was changed, and I was to lie a long way off. I rolled myself up in the counterpane and wept. There he is, ma'am. Davy! Davy, what's the matter? Peggotty, this is your doing. How could you? How could you turn my own boy against me? Against anybody dear to me? What do you mean by it, you cruel thing? Lord, forgive you, Mrs. Copperfield. And for what you have said this minute, may you never be truly sorry. On my honeymoon, too. When you think my worst enemy might relent and not envy me a little peace of mind and happiness. Oh, dear, what a troublesome world this is when one has most right to expect it to be as agreeable as possible. What's this? Clara, my love, have you forgotten? Firmness, my dear. I'm very sorry, Edward. I meant to be firm, but I'm so uncomfortable. Indeed. Well, that's bad hearing so soon. I say it's very hard I should be made so now. It is very hard, isn't it? Go below, my love. Yes, Edward. David and I will come down together. Yes, Edward. My friend, do you know your mistress's name? She's been my mistress a long time, sir. I ought to know it. That's true. But I thought I heard you, as I came upstairs, address her by a name that is not hers. She has taken mine, you know. Will you remember that? Sir? David, if I have an obstinate horse or dog to deal with, what do you think I do? I don't know. I beat him. I make him wince and smart. I say to myself, I'll conquer the fellow, and if it were to cost him all the bloody head, I should do it. What's that mark on your face? Dirt. Dirt? You have a good deal of intelligence for a little fellow. I see you understand me very well. Hm. Wash that face and come down. He knew as well as I that it was the mark of tears, but my baby heart would have burst before I told him so. A word of encouragement, of pity, of welcome home, of reassurance to me that it was home, might have made me dutiful to him in my heart, and might have made me respect instead of hate him. After dinner, a coach drove up to the garden gate, and he went out to receive the visitor. Jane, I hope you're well. I am very well, thank you, Edward. My mother followed him, and very timidly, I went after her. Clara is anxious to welcome you. Davy, Davy, my darling, you must love your new father, and you must be a good, obedient boy. Clara, mm. you are well, I trust. Very well. Th you are well, I trust. Very well, thank you, Jane. Is that your boy, sister-in-law? Yes, this is Davy. Generally speaking, I don't like boys. How do you do, boy? Very well. I hope you are. Hmm. Once manner. Now, Edward, may I see my room? Upstairs, Jane. I trust you had a comfortable... You must journey. be very polite to Miss Murdstone, Davy. Miss Murdstone? Is she? She is Mr. Murdstone's sister. It seemed that Miss Murdstone had come to stay with us for good. A gloomy-looking lady she was, dark like her brother, whom she greatly resembled. She had a hard steel purse, kept in a very jail of a bag, which hung on her arm by a heavy chain, and shut up like a bite. And she was embellished with numerous little steel fetters and rivets in the place of softer adornments. I have never in my life seen such a metallic lady. Every morning she was up at Cockcrow. She took over the running of the household and demanded the keys on the pretext that my mother was far too pretty and thoughtless to have any duties imposed on her. Yes, Jane. That seems to be in order. Thank you. I'm glad you approve my accounts, Edward. 
Uh, one other matter. With your approval, I shall take our custom to another butcher. This man's prices are far too high. Do as you think fit, Jane. <laughs> what is this? I do think I might be consulted. Clara, I wonder at you. Oh, it's very well to say you wonder, Edward, but you wouldn't like it yourself. It's very hard that in my own house I... My own house? Our own house, I mean. Edward, it is very hard that in in your own house I may not have a word to say about domestic matters. I'm sure I managed very well before we were married. Ask Peggotty. Edward, let there be an end of this. I go tomorrow. Jane Murdstone, be silent. I don't want anybody to go. I'd be very miserable if anybody was to go. I don't ask much. I only want to be consulted sometimes as a mere form. I'm sure I'm very much obliged to anybody that assists me. I thought you were pleased once, Edward, at my being inexperienced and girlish. But you seem to hate me for it now. You're so severe. Edward, I go tomorrow. Jane Murdstone, be silent. Clara, you astound me. Yes. I had a satisfaction in marrying an inexperienced and artless person and forming her character, infusing into it some of the firmness and decision of which it stood in need. But when Jane Murdstone is kind enough to assist me in this endeavour and assume for my sake a condition very like that of a housekeeper, and when she meets with a base return... Oh, Edward, don't accuse me of being ungrateful. I have many faults, but not that. Oh, don't, my dear. When Jane Murdstone meets, I say, with a base return, that feeling of mine is chilled and altered. Oh, don't, my love, I can't bear to hear Weakness this. Weakness can have no weight with me. You lose breath. Uh, I couldn't live under coldness and unkindness. Uh, I'm so sorry. I have my defects and it's very good of you to correct them for me. Jane, I don't object to anything. I should be broken-hearted if you thought of leaving. Jane Murdstone, <laughs> harsh words between us are uncommon. It is not my fault that they have occurred tonight, nor is it your fault. We were both betrayed into them by another. Let us forget it. This is not a fit scene for the boy. David, go to bed. From that day, my mother never gave an opinion on anything without first appealing to Miss Murdstone. There had been some talk of my going to boarding school, but nothing had been concluded. In the meantime, I learned at home. I remember one terrible morning. I went into the parlour and found my mother looking anxious, Miss Murdstone looking firm, and Mr Murdstone binding something round the bottom of a cane. Ah, that will do. Oh, Edward! Good morning, David. Good morning, sir. I tell you, Clara, I have often been flogged myself. To be sure. But, Jane, do you think it did Edward any good? Do you think it did Edward any harm, Clara? That's the point. Oh, certainly, my dear Jane. Now, David, you must be far more careful today. Your tables, Davy, dear. Let us start with the twice times table. Two times one... No, Clara. He must know the simpler tables by now. The twelve times table. Very well, Edward. Davy. Twelve times one is twelve. Twelve times two is twenty-four. Twelve times three is thirty-six. Twelve times four... Twelve times four... Oh, Davy, Davy... Not Clara. Be firm with the boy. Don't say, oh, Davy, Davy, that's childish. He knows his tables, or he does not know them. He does not know them. Davy, try just once more, and don't be stupid. Twelve times one is twelve. Twelve times two is twenty-four. Twelve times three... Twelve times three... Thirty-six. Clara! He does not know his tables. Put the book aside. Now, David, pay attention. If I go into a cheesemonger's shop and buy 5,006 double Gloucester cheeses at fourpence halfpenny each, what must I pay? David? Uh, I... The boy's an imbecile. Oh, David. 
Clara! I'm not quite well, my dear Jane. Why, Jane, we can hardly expect Clara to bear with perfect firmness the worry and torment David has occasioned her today. We cannot expect so much from her. David, you and I will go upstairs. Oh, Edward, no! Clara, are you a perfect fool? Oh, shut, shut! Pray don't beat me! Quiet, boy! I am trying to learn... Have you, David? We'll see. No, sir, oh. please. Oh, don't beat me, sir. Please don't beat me. It was only a moment I stopped him, for he cut me heavily an instant uh, afterwards. Uh, and in the uh, same instant, uh, I caught the hand with which he held me between my teeth and bit it through. You wicked, obdurate boy. Uh, 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 he beat me then, uh, as if he would have beaten me uh, to death. He was gone, the door was locked, and I was lying fevered and hurt and torn, raging upon the floor. It grew dark. Miss Murdstone came in with a tray on which were bread and milk and meat. She put it down, glaring at me, went out, and shut and locked the door again. My imprisonment lasted five days. Those five days in my remembrance seem like years. Davy? Davy dear? Peggy, where are you? Outside. Hush, or the cat will hear us. How's Mama, Peggy? Is she very angry with me? No. No, no. Not very. What's to be done with me, Peggy dear? Do you know? Um, school. Near London. Oh, when? Tomorrow. Shall I... Shall I see Mama? Yes, you will, Davy. Tomorrow morning. Davy, dear. Yes, Peggy. If I haven't been exactly as intimate with you as I used to be, it ain't because I don't love you. That's because I thought it better for you. And for someone else, besides. Oh, Peggy. Oh, my own... What I mean to say is, you must never forget me, for I'll never forget you. And I'll take as much care of your mamma as ever I took of you. The day may come when she'll be glad to lay her poor head on her stupid, cross old Peggotty's arm again. From that night, I felt something for Peggotty I cannot very well define. She didn't replace my mother. No one could do that. But she came into a vacancy in my heart, which closed upon her, and I felt towards her something I've never felt for any other human being. The following morning, Miss Murdstone brought me my breakfast, and then took me down to the parlour, where I ran into my mother's Mama, arms. Mama, Mama, I'm so sorry. Oh, Davy, that you could hurt anyone I love. Try to be better. Pray to be better. I forgive you, but I'm so grieved, Davy, that you should have such bad passions in your heart. Clara, the carrier is waiting. Davy, you're going for your own good. I forgive you, my dear boy. God bless you. Clara! Mama! Don't dawdle, boy. I hope you repent before you come to a bad end. Stop! Mr. Vargas! Stop! Oh. oh, Davy, my darling. My cat wouldn't let me come out to see you leave. But I slipped away and ran to catch you here. Take these cakes, my love. You'll be hungry. And here's money from your mama and me. Dear Peggotty. Goodbye, my treasure. Thank you, Mr. Marcus. Mark. Are you going all the way, Mr. Barkers? All the way where? There. Mm. Where's there? Near London. Why, that there horse will be deader than pork before he got over half the ground. Are you only going to Yarmouth, then? That's about it. And there I shall take you to the stagecoach. The stagecoach will take you to wherever it is. Thank you, Mr. Barkers. Would you like a cake? 
She make them now? Do you mean Peggy, sir? Ah, hair. Yes, she makes all our pastry and does all our cooking. Do she though? Oh. No sweethearts, I believe. Oh no, she never had a sweetheart. Didn't she though? So she make all the apple pasties. Oh. Does all the cooking, do she? Yes. Well, I tell you what, perhaps you'll be writing to him. Oh yes, I will. I shall write straight away when I get to Yarmouth. Oh, well, if you're writing to her, perhaps you'd recollect to say that Barkis is willing, would you? That Barkis is willing. Is that all the message? Yes. Yes, Barkis is willing. Remember, Barkis is willing. My dear Peggotty, I have come here safe. Barkis is willing. My love to Mama, yours affectionately, Davy. P.S. He says he particularly wants you to know. Barkis is willing. Is there anybody here for a youngster? Booked in the name of uh, Murstone from Blunderstone, Suffolk. To be left till called for. Try Copperfield, if you please, sir. Uh, is, is there anybody here for a youngster? Booked in the name of Murdstone from Blunderstone, Suffolk, but answering to the name of Copperfield. To be left till called for. <sighs> Calm. Is there anybody? <laughs> Better give him a brass collar and tie him up in the stable. <laughs> Nobody claimed me. I sat in the booking office, looking at the parcels and packages, and wondering if Mr. Murdstone had devised this plan to get rid of me, and if he had, what I could do. I thought I might try to enlist as a soldier or sailor, but I was only eight years old, so perhaps they wouldn't take me. However, the problem did not arise. For at last, a gaunt young man in need of a shave came into the office and whispered to the clerk, who pushed me over to him as if I were weighed, bought, delivered and paid for. We walked out of the office, hand in hand. So you're the new boy? Yes, sir. I'm one of the masters at Salem House. Is it far? It's down by Blackheath. We'll go by the stagecoach. It's about six miles. If you please, sir. I'm very hungry. Why, then you must have breakfast. I have to call on an old lady near here. We'll buy some food and she'll cook it for you. That's right, young sir. Thank you. Eat it all. It'll do you good. Oh, Charlie. Charlie, my boy. Yes? Have you got your flute with you? Yes, I have. Oh, whoever blow at it, do. While a young gentleman's having his breakfast. Oh, it's delicious! Oh, go on, Charlie. After many years of consideration, my impression is there can never have been anybody in the world who played worse. But the old woman was so delighted, she gave him an affectionate squeeze round the neck, and this oh, mercifully Charlie. stopped him playing. <laughs> However, my breakfast really was delicious, and I enjoyed it even in the dismal surroundings of the almshouse cottage. At last, the master at Salem House, whose name I found was Mr. Mel, although the old lady called him my Charlie, took me to catch the coach for Blackheath, where I fell asleep. Salem House was a square brick building with wings, very bare and unfurnished, and quite empty because it was holiday time. I had been sent there early as a punishment. The schoolroom was the most forlorn and desolate place I have ever seen. Suddenly, I came on a placard, beautifully written, lying on a desk. It said, Take care of him. He bites. Sir? Yes? 
Where's the dog? What dog? That's to be taken care of, sir. That bites. That's not a dog, Copperfield. That's a boy. My instructions are to put this placard on your back. Oh, sir. I'm sorry to make such a beginning with you, but I must do it. He tied the placard on me like a knapsack. And I was still wearing it, deeply ashamed, when I was summoned to see the headmaster, Mr. Creakle. So, this is a young gentleman whose teeth are to be filed. Turn round. Sir. Take care of him. He bites. Good. Come here, boy. Yes, sir. I have the happiness of knowing your stepfather. I know worthy man he is, and a man of strong character. He knows me, and I know him. Do you know me? Hey? Not yet, sir. You will soon. I tell you what I am. I am a Tartar. When I say a thing, I do it. When I say I will have a thing done, I will have it done. My flesh and blood, when it rises against me, is not my flesh and blood. I discard it. Now, You've begun to know me, my young friend. And you I go. If you please, sir. <gasps> what? What's this? Sir, I'm very sorry indeed for what I did. If I might be allowed to take this writing off before the boys come back. <sighs> oh, sir! But even facing the headmaster was not as terrible to me as facing my fellow pupils with that placard on my back. Hello. Are you the new boy? Yes. What's your name? David Copperfield. What's your name? Look, up here. The gate with all the names carved on it. Yes. Mine's in the right-hand corner. Over the top bolt. See? Mm. Traddles. That's right. Tommy Traddles. What's that on your back? I say, look here. Sample. See what Copperfield's got on his back. <laughs> <laughs> he bites. Down, sir. Down, <laughs> On the whole, although it cost me a few tears in private, it wasn't as bad as I'd expected. They laughed, but they laughed at it, not at me. One name was carved many times on the playground gate, and carved very deeply. It was J. Steerforth. Before this boy, who was at least half a dozen years my senior and very good-looking, I was carried as before a magistrate. Steerforth, this is the new boy. The new boy, eh? What's your name? David Copperfield, sir. Welcome to Salem House, David Copperfield. What's that on your back? Turn round. Yes, sir. Take care of him, he bites. <laughs> Be quiet. What does it mean, Copperfield? My stepfather. He made them put it on me. He was beating me, you see, and I bit him. Yes, I see. Well, young Copperfield, I think it's a jolly shame. From that day, I became bound to steer forth forever afterwards, and no one in the school dared to laugh at me again. Later that day, steer forth paid me the compliment of walking with me in the playground. I was conscious of the honour done to me and the envy of the other boys. What money have you got, Copperfield? Six shillings. You'd better give it to me to take care of. At least you can if you like. You needn't if you don't like. Here you are, sir. Perhaps you'd like to spend a couple of shillings or so on a bottle of currant wine by and by, up in the bedroom. You belong to my bedroom, I find. Yes, I should like that. Good. And another shilling or so on biscuits, and another on fruit. Well... I say, young Copperfield, you're going it. Well, we must make it stretch all we can. I can go out when I like, and I'll smuggle the prog in. That night, Steerforth sat on my pillow, handing out the viands to us all, and dispensing the current wine. A certain mysterious feeling, consequent on the darkness, the secrecy, and the whisper in which everything was said, 
steals over me again as I look back. Give me the matches. Yes, sir. Ah, here's the wine. <gasps> it's very dark. <laughs> look! Oh, Lord! Look over there! What is it? In the corner, the headless man! <laughs> Quiet, Traddles. It's all right, John Copperfield. Just Traddles' nonsense. <laughs> Have you met our esteemed headmaster yet, Copperfield? Oh, yes. Don't shiver. He isn't here. But he never lays a hand on you, Steerforth. I'd like to see him try. Oh, well, that's all the current wine. Time we all went to bed. Good night, young Copperfield. I'll take care of you. You're very kind to me. You haven't got a sister, have you? No. That's a pity. If you had one, I should think she'd have been a pretty, timid, little bright-eyed sort of a girl. I should have liked to know her. Good night, young Copperfield. Good night, sir. I thought of him very much after I went to bed and raised myself to look at him where he lay in the moonlight with his handsome face turned up and his head reclining easily on his arm. He was a person of great power in my eyes, but no veiled future dimly glanced upon him in the moonbeams. There was no shadowy picture of his footsteps in the garden I walked in my dreams. <laughs> 